We've got a roundtable coming your way with a brand new contributor giving you all the latest out of Michigan fall camp, plus 22 facts you have to know about the AP preseason college football poll that may foretell the season to come. All that and more next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it. Him Cook. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it. And a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Greetings and go blue and welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. I'm Steve Dace and we're not going to hesitate whatsoever. Let's get right to it. It is our roundtable looking at what we've learned so far in fall camp and what it might mean for the actual fall. Michael Spath is somebody you're used to hearing here on Michigan Podcast. He joins me at Wolverine Digest. He's also the host of his own show on WTKA in Ann Arbor. And Michael, we have a new member of our team at Wolverine Digest who is joining us on the roundtable this week, Brandon Brown. Why don't you introduce him to our audience for us? Yeah, absolutely. Brandon uh, has been in the sports journalism field for the last uh, five years, uh, working at the Wolverine.com. Um, I'm sure uh, people are very familiar with him uh, from his days, re- you know, covering recruiting for them. Um, he's got a background coaching uh, football and basketball uh, down in the South. So a little bit of a, you know, faux pas there. He coached in South Carolina, um, but a great guy. He's been on our show, on my show, numerous times. Uh, doing uh, football recruiting talk, and now he is joining us uh, full time on Inside the Huddle and with Wolverine Digest. He's going to be bringing analytical voice, lots of opinions, uh, doing a lot of great graphics, works, and video uh, that you'll be looking forward to on Wolverine Digest in the weeks and months to come. Well, Brandon, that's uh, quite an introduction, and I think at least half of it is true. And we are very, very happy to have you with us here on Wolverine Digest and Michigan Podcast. So let me start uh, with you. Let's go ahead and break your maiden right away. What's to you the biggest surprise that you've learned, heard through fall camp? And what does that tell you you about the season Michigan's about to have unfold? recent actually i know when josh gaddis was initially hired and he was hired as the offensive coordinator and everybody said uh you know he's getting he's getting the keys of the offense handed over to him it's going to be totally his show i was thinking that there's no way there's no way jim harbaugh is going to do that that's not the kind of coach he is he's never been that way but obviously as time marched on and now that we're just you know 10 days or so away from kickoff it's pretty apparent that jim harbaugh is going to be hands off at least that's what we've heard Obviously, we won't know until we see it, but it definitely seems to be Josh Gaddis's baby, and I think that's 
a welcome change, and I think it's a massive change. I mean, it's completely unprecedented for Jim Harbaugh, and it's going to look very, very different from everything that we've heard. I mean, we see little clips and little bits and pieces here. I know there was a clip the other day where Shea Patterson ran an RPO. He got the snap. He threw a ball, and then he ran out, and an assistant kind of pitched him another ball, and then he kind of pitched it off like a speed option. I mean, that's that's just something we haven't seen in the last couple of years at Michigan. So that's it's a huge change. I mean, I was – Skeptical when Gaddis was hired and then surprised when it started to look like, wow, okay, Jim Harbaugh's really going to be hands off of this thing. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll see here in just a few days uh, if that's really how it's going to look. Michael, same question to you. What's the biggest surprise you've learned so far about fall camp? And, and what do you think that foretells for the season to come? You know, I don't think there's been any major surprises on my end. Uh, maybe just the fact that uh, when you look across the board offensively, um, they have more talent uh, and more depth than I was expecting them to have. Uh, they're loaded at the quarterback position with Shea Patterson and Dill McCaffrey and Joe Milton waiting in the wings. Uh, they, they seem to be pretty well stocked at tight end. They are absolutely, I mean, every team in college football would like to trade for Michigan's wide receivers. Uh, between Nico Collins, Tariq Black, Don Peoples-Jones, Ronnie Bell, who's come on, and then the uh, the the, in, the incoming freshmen um, who've already stood out, uh, Mike Sainer still and Cornelius Johnson. Uh, offensive line took a little bit of a hit with Andrew Stuber going down last week, but they still feel like that's the most talented offensive line they've had in a long time. It's just it's the most talented offense that Jim Harbaugh has had uh, and the deepest offense that Jim Harbaugh has had in his five years. And as much as there's a couple of little concerns, and we can certainly talk about them defensively, uh, in today's college football, you are winning uh, with, with offense, with outscoring teams. It's the Oklahoma model. Um, it's the, you know, to some degree, it's the Alabama model. It's been the Ohio State model uh, the last few years. It's the Georgia model. Um, yeah, these teams have good defenses, and certainly in the college football playoffs, uh, Alabama and Clemson's defenses uh, really shine. Uh, but teams are winning by outscoring and just outslugging their opponents these days, and it finally looks like Michigan is poised to be able to do that under Jim Harbaugh. Yesterday, gentlemen, Michigan named its three captains for the 2019 season, and yet again, what I like to call the Demetrius Brown rule ruled once more, which is be very hesitant about giving up on guys in a college career. Demetrius Brown, you'll recall 30 years ago, once threw seven interceptions in a game against Michigan State, four to the same guy, uh, and then ended up uh, being the starting quarterback for Bo's final Rose Bowl winning team a year later. You think of guys like Jeremy Gallon, who couldn't catch a punt when Rich Rod was here, and uh, with a new coaching staff, got a new lease on life, and and set uh, was one of the best, uh, most prolific receivers Michigan ever had. And so now you look at Kalik Hudson, voted captain yesterday. This is a guy that had a very star-crossed season a year ago, and yet here he is a year later. Captain Ben Bredesen, I think now is one of only 14 two-time captains uh, in, in Michigan history. And then Carlo Kemp is a guy that we have seen emerge a lot as a vocal spokes, a spokesperson for the team in the offseason. Brandon, let me go to you first here. These three captains tell you what about this year's team? that the rest of the team and the coaching staff values hard work and leadership. I mean, I think that, that certainly oozes from guys like Carlo Kemp and Ben Bredesen. Uh, Kalik Hudson comes off to me as a little more soft-spoken, more of a, you know, when, when you interview him and stuff, he doesn't, he's not as long-winded as the other guys, and that's not necessarily what makes a great leader. But for him, it's all about lead by example, how he practices. We heard uh, Anthony Campanelli mention that he practices like a maniac, we obviously know he basically lives in the weight room, uh, and he's just done a little bit of everything at Michigan and does everything that he's asked to do. He's not the biggest. He's probably not the fastest, but he goes 100 miles an hour all the time, and he absolutely puts everything into it. I think you get that with the other two guys as well, but they're, they're so cerebral. Both Carlo Kemp and, and Ben Bredesen are great interviews. You get the sense that if they had to – if, if maybe Ed Warren was out sick or maybe if uh, Sean Newell was out sick that you could count on Ben Bredesen or Carlo Kemp to rally the troops and get the guys together and deliver a pregame speech or talk about the game plan. You just get that sense with those two guys. And I think that's really important, both of them seniors, uh, all of them seniors and ready to kind of lead this team with a pretty special season. So I think it's, 
it's just kind of the guys that they are, the way that they go about their business. They're very professional already as college kids, and, and that's something that the young guys can really look to and something that everybody can lean on, uh, both during practice weeks and in the games. So, Michael, you look at these three guys that are Michigan's captains. Ben Bredesen was a big-time recruit. He has started from the day he arrived on campus. He's in rarefied air as a two-time captain. Kalik Hudson was one of those three-star uh, with uh, measurables that Jim Harbaugh specialized in at Stanford. Came in here and set the world on fire his first year as a starter. Last year, didn't live up to expectations, but this year he's been voted captain. And then you look at a guy like Carlo Kemp. I think he's on his third different position on the defense now. Went to linebacker. Uh, played on the edge. Now he's looking at uh, maybe playing the nose guard position this fall. Those three guys being named captain, same question to you. What do they tell you about the 2019 Wolverines? Uh, I'm going to, you know, I don't know if you'd love this answer or not, but I have no idea what they tell me about the 2019 Wolverines <laughs> because, because you know what, Steve, I, I was thinking about a lot about captains because someone, you know, asked me on Twitter if I thought that's like where this group would rank. And I said, well, let's see how the team does this year. You know, 1997, Eric Mays and John Jansen get elected captains. Uh, and if you were coming in the year, um, you know, you might say, like, oh, you know, who, like, you knew who John Jansen was a little bit. He'd been a starter, but who's Eric Mays? Is this guy going to be any good? Well, they win a national championship, and now Eric Mays and John Jansen are revered and as two of the greatest captains of all time. I'll go back to something Red Berenson used to tell me. He said, you know, there were times where we had captains for the Michigan hockey team who I thought were outstanding captains but they never won anything, and so they get forgotten in the record books. And we had seasons where we had, co- where we had captains where, uh, you know, they were good, but not as maybe as good as some of the other guys I had, and we won a national championship, or we won CCHA titles, or we went to Frozen Fours, and those guys get remembered for being great captains. And so, I mean, I agree with Brandon that I think they, there's a little bit of favoring uh, maybe leadership and intangibles over substance. Uh, that's not to say that these guys are, you know, not haven't accomplished anything yet. But if you were to talk about the 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 glamour positions, the guys that are going to make the most plays, uh, you're going to go down and say, hey, it's going to be Shea Patterson. Hey, it's going to be uh, one of the wide receivers for Michigan. Uh, defensively, it could be a, a, a defensive end. Defensively, it could be Josh Metellus. It could be Josh Ross. And yet they seem to favor no-nonsense, team-first guys, I think a big big part of this, and you and I had this discussion a couple weeks ago about whether or not you'd be able to police this, is I think that Jim Harbaugh truly wanted guys that were all in for the team and that wouldn't be wouldn't sacrifice the team for themselves when it comes to late in the season, especially skipping a bowl game. And when you look at Ben Bredesen, I mean, the guy started you know eight games as a freshman, started 13 games as a sophomore, 13 games as a junior. Uh, he's not going to be skipping any bowl games. Like, he lives and dies this. This is... He's an offensive lineman. He's out of a glamour position. He's just going to go out there and do his job. Carlo Kemp is the same way. As you mentioned, third position uh, in his five years. You know, he's just going to do his job without trying to get any type of attention for it. And, and even though Cleek Hudson probably, you know, has really uh, high NFL potential, he doesn't seem like – he seems like a, a, a lunch pail type of player and not a, hey, everybody look at me, everybody talk about me type of player. So – I think that's that's the common trait among these guys. But whether that means that Michigan's going to be super successful this year or not, I don't know. A year in, in a year from now, we're going to look back and go like, "Wow, those guys were great captains." Michigan went to the playoffs, won a Big Ten title. Or we'll look back and go like, "Ah, maybe the fact that they were so quiet and unassuming guys is is a reason that they didn't take off." Gentlemen, are either one of you? Concerned, or did, are you raising the Spock one eyebrow at the fact that you're returning senior All Big Ten quarterback? Uh, the first starting senior returning starting quarterback at Michigan of the Harbaugh era, not voted a captain. His father tweeted something out today earlier about we're here to win games and not popularity contests that a lot of uh, Michigan social media is taking as a veiled reference to uh, Shea not being voted a captain. Do you, do you take anything away from either from that whatsoever? Brandon, I'll start with you. Well, I might be stealing a little bit of Mike's thunder here because we talked about this on the radio show today and a little bit off of air with one of Mike's guests. Um, but he, he had an interesting point. Um, I think he said, where did he coach Mike? He was an assistant coach at Brighton. Was that right? He's our guest from the radio today? Yeah, he's an assistant coach Mike at Brighton Michigan. High School. and yeah. So his thought was that the quarterback is almost like a built-in defaulted captain. by Just by the nature of the position, they're the most vocal in terms of 
you know, speaking up and kind of being the face of your program. So not to say that it's a waste, I'm doing air quotes here, but a wasted captain spot. But the quarterback is, is, looked, to, is looked to as a leader already. So there's no need to really give them the captain title. And we went down the list of some very prominent Michigan quarterbacks who were never named a captain before. So I don't, you know, I, I said this on the radio and, and Steve, you hit it right on the head. Maybe it's worth an eyebrow, but that's about it. I mean, I don't get, I don't see Shea Patterson as someone who's going to have his feelings hurt or that this is going to affect his play or that it's a, or that it speaks to the kind of person that he is. I've never heard a negative word about him, whether it's his attitude, his work ethic, how he prepares, how he cares about the team and the position. And I think there's also the factor that he's only been at Michigan for two years. I mean, I don't know if that comes into consideration at all, but we're not talking about a guy who started his career here, who who bled maize and blue from the time he arrived on campus. I mean, I'm not trying to take away from what he believes about the team and the program now, but he did start at another program. So that probably is somewhat of a factor as well, but I, I don't see it really being that big of a deal. It's a little curious, you know, that his dad tweeted that out. Maybe it's bothering him more than it is Shea. But I think an eyebrow and a little discussion is about all there is, and, and that's about it. you agree with that, Michael? Yeah, I do. And, you know, um, you did steal my thunder, thanks. But, uh, <laughs> but no, you know, Chad Henning was a four-year starter at Michigan, never a captain. And Lloyd Carson, uh, that was one of the Brian toughest Gr- players who ever coached, was Chad Henning. Yeah. Brian Greasy, when people talk about Brian Greasy and the way, reason that Michigan won a national championship, I mean, even Charles Woodson – uh, defers to Brian Greasy a little bit and talks about his leadership and what he meant to that team in 1997. Not a captain. Hmm. Um, you know, it's a it's a C that you put on your your jersey, and we probably spend more time with it than than we need to because of uh, the the tradition and the history of Michigan football. But no, I, I'm not I'm not overly worried about it. I, I agree. I agree. You know, with Brandon, what he's saying that uh, quarterback is built in. He doesn't seem like that's going to be the type of thing that bothers him. Um, I think this is a non-issue. And if it was an issue, and if the coaches thought that for some reason, hey, the team needs him to be a captain or this whole thing, I think he would have a C on his jersey right now. I think they're looking at him saying he's going to, he's our leader of our offense, and he's going to be the leader of our offense, and nothing's going to change that. And so everything's, kind of, everything's fine because Harbaugh even uh, intimated um, throughout this summer that the coaches were going to have a little bit more say and who was named the captain, and whether that meant that they were going to have a direct vote or they were going to trump people or they were going to steer the, the vote in a certain way, I think if they really wanted Shea Patterson to be a captain, he would be a captain today. All right, gentlemen, i got about 90 seconds here. Uh, the final few days of camp uh, await before game week starts on Monday. Your biggest concern down the stretch here is, is blank. Michael, I'll start with you this time. I'm still concerned about the defensive tackles. Um, I, I think after Carlo Kemp and, you know, we're hearing good things about Donovan Jeter, but he's really never played uh, of any significance so far. Michael Dwumfor, who was a starter a year ago, still kind of banged up, not going 100% um, in practices. And then you've got two true freshmen, Mozzie Smith and Chris Hinton. Uh, I think defensive tackle is going to be a position to keep an eye on, especially the first couple of weeks, and see how Michigan maybe changes things up in their front four and their front seven in order to get the best players on the field. Brandon, same question to you. I, I still think it's running back. I mean, I, I know that you know, people have been talking about how there's a lot more depth there than you realize, and there's going to be plenty of guys who can play, but the fact remains that there's not a proven guy there. True Wilson is, is solid in a lot of areas, but he's not a game-breaker. He's not you know, a, pro, a playoff team type of featured running back, and that's not a knock on the kid. He's tough. He works hard. He'll stick his face in the fan. He can block, and he carries the ball pretty well. But, but he's not a game-breaker at the position. And then you've got two really young guys who haven't hardly done anything in, in Zach Charbonnet and Christian Turner. So I think, depending on how the offense is going to look and what Josh Gaddis wants to do, that's still a bit of a question mark because there's just not a guy who's done a lot there before. Brandon Brown, Michael Spath from Wolverine Digest and WTK in Ann Arbor. Uh, guys, this was fantastic, this conversation. We're going to definitely make this a regular part of what we do here on Michigan Podcast. Go Blue to both of you. Thanks for joining us here this week on MP. All right, Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Steve. We'll come back, and when we do, everything you ever wanted to know about the preseason AP poll, but we're afraid to ask, and maybe it gives us some omens about the season to come here uh, that's going to kick off on Saturday. We'll get to that here in a moment. 
Well, as you just heard, we're very excited about the addition of Brandon Brown to our website at WolverineDigest.com. He has been a fixture covering Michigan football, uh, particularly recruiting, but uh, team-based stuff as well for the last several years for the Wolverine. And now he will be doing the same for us here at WolverineDigest.com, beginning with focusing on covering both Michigan football and men's basketball. Then he'll be branching out from there. And we've already upped the content ante quite a bit, but it's it's about to get uh, a massive turbo injection here from the likes of Brandon Brown. So we're very excited that Brandon is joining us here at Wolverine Digest. That's a great place for you to keep up with everything we do all week long in between episodes here at Michigan Podcast. Just go to WolverineDigest.com. Well, it's out, the preseason AP college football poll, and it may, if you look at its history, it may have a lot to tell us about the season that is to come. So here are 22 facts that you need to know about the AP preseason college football poll, beginning with fact number one. Clemson's streak of nine straight seasons of finishing the season higher than their ranking in the preseason AP poll will come to an end now that the Tigers are the preseason number one team for the first time ever. I mean, there's nowhere to go but down. That's, an, a, that's one of the most amazing streaks I've ever seen in the history of this sport. Nine years in a row, Clemson outperformed their preseason ranking. By the way, uh, fellow Michigan fans, we have not outperformed our preseason ranking since 1999. That was the last time we outperformed our preseason ranking. So there you go. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next fact, number two. For the first time since 2015, Alabama is not the preseason number one team. But don't cry for me, Argentina, because for the last five times, the Crimson Tide weren't ranked preseason number one. They went on to win the national title. So Nick Saban's got us right where he wants us, if history is any indication. Number three. This preseason poll marks the first time since October of 2003 that seven Big Ten teams were ranked at the same time by the AP. So you can see the depth of the Big Ten continues to show itself, continues to show that it is improving. And that doesn't even count Northwestern, by the way. Fact number four, uh, however, a whopping 11 teams in last season's preseason AP poll didn't finish the season ranked that's 44% of last year's preseason poll didn't finish the regular season ranked. Fact number five, 15 of the 20 teams to make the college football playoff so far were ranked in the top 10 of the preseason AP poll. That's a 75% trend. So what that tells you is three of the four members of the college football playoffs are in that top 10 because we go to fact number six. However, that also means that each season so far of the playoff, a team outside of the top 10 of the preseason AP poll went on to make it. And last year, that was number 12, Notre Dame. So every year of the playoff, at least so far, we've had one team not in the top 10 make it to the college football playoff. Number seven, no team ranked lower than number 19 in the preseason AP poll has so far made the college football playoff with one exception or the lowest ranking, I should say was Oklahoma. They were number 19 in the 2015 preseason poll. And then they made the playoff. That's the lowest ranking so far by anybody. Fact number eight, this is the first time since 2001 that USC was unranked in the preseason AP poll. That's Pete Carroll's first year there uh, with the Trojans. By the way, they only had one vote one point was all they had in the preseason ap poll for usc is that is that like ever happened i mean like ever number nine this is notre dame's ranking in the preseason ap highest ranking in the preseason ap poll since 2006 that's great news for the irish right and take it to fact number 10 all right, so here's your rest of the story, Paul Harvey. Notre Dame hasn't started and finished a year in the AP Top 10 since 1993. In fact, the last time they were in the preseason AP Top 10 was 2016, and the Irish went 4-8. and eight. Fact number 11, 11 years in a row now, a team ranked in the Top 10 of the preseason AP poll 
finished the regular season unranked. Last year, that actually happened to three teams. Number four, Wisconsin, number seven, Auburn, and number eight, Miami, all finished unranked after, after being in the preseason top 10. Fact 12, number 14 is the highest Utah has ever been rated in the preseason AP poll. A lot of, in fact, the, the, the media, the Pac-12 media voted Utah the favorite in the South Division. Number 13, Iowa State is rated in the preseason AP poll for the first time since 1978. This is before the Fonz jumped the shark. When we watched Laverne and Shirley, Star Wars was still new and hadn't been ruined uh, by Jar Jar Binks yet. 1978, Rick Leach going into his senior year, the Georgia Peach going into his, uh, well, that's that's Ty Cobb. He was the Michigan Peach. Uh, Ricky the Peach Leach going into his senior year at Michigan in 1978. Woody Hayes going into what would become his final year at Ohio State in 1978. That's the last time Iowa State was in the preseason AP poll. Number 14, Iowa and Iowa State are both rated in the preseason AP poll for the first time ever. That's that's never happened before. 15, this is the first time since 1977 that both Florida State and Miami failed to be ranked in the preseason AP poll that had not happened since the year Star Wars was released. 1977. Michigan was ranked number one in the country, uh, I think, for five weeks during 1977 before losing to Minnesota, of all teams. 1977 was a long time ago. That's, that's how dominant Florida State and Miami have been on the college football landscape. Number 16, Nebraska is the first team to be ranked in the preseason AP poll after winning fewer than five games the previous year since Alabama in 2001. And uh, the Crimson Tide went seven and five that next season. Number 17, for the first time since 1998, Syracuse is ranked in the preseason AP poll. Man, I got a good look at those 98 orange. I went to that uh, 98 Michigan Syracuse game, blistering hot day. Hold on a second. I think Donovan McNabb just, just scored again. I mean, Syracuse ran us out of the big house that day. I mean, that was, that was a brutal afternoon. And that was the last time Syracuse was ranked in the preseason AP poll. Wow. Donovan McNabb, 1998. Number 18, this is the first time Texas has been ranked higher than 15th in the preseason AP poll since 2010. That's, that's almost a decade. Number 19, we're getting close to the end. Seven of the last eight national champions were in the top five of the preseason AP poll. The one exception, Florida State, Back in 2013 was number 11. Well, what about Ohio State kind of came out of nowhere? Well, they were preseason number five that year. They just lost an ugly game early uh, to Virginia Tech uh, and then kind of had to battle their way back from there. So Florida State, only one of the last eight national champions in 2013 that was not in the preseason AP top five. Uh, let's go to number 20. 25 of the past 26 years. A team not ranked in the preseason AP poll finished in the top 10. That's happened 25 of the last 26 years. Last season, that team was Washington State. 21. For the first time since 2010, the Pac-12 does not have a team in the top 10 of the preseason AP poll. But hey, that could be a good omen. Because the last time that happened, Oregon ended up playing Auburn and Cam Newton for the BCS National Championship. So there you go. And that leads us to our final fact. This one is for the home folks. Michigan has now been ranked more times in the top 10 of the AP poll since Jim Harbaugh took over in 2015. 29 times Michigan has been ranked in the top 10. That is more than they were ranked from 2005 to 2014, the decade before he arrived. They were ranked in the top 10 17 times. In fact, it's not even close. All right. We'll come back. We've got our Twitter poll results and the question of the week next. 
You can tell the season is nigh because we're upping the ante where the content is concerned on our Patreon page as well. I've already got some week zero and week one early lines. I played earlier this year with an opportunity uh, for you, if you're one of our subscribers, to look at those lines and see how they've adjusted. We've opened up a brand new sports book here in Des Moines, Iowa, where I live, and you've gotten the chance to see the the first uh, game that uh, or set of games that uh, I've played at our sports book there as well. We'll be giving you exclusive post-game podcasts, instant reactions to every Michigan game on our Patreon page as well. If you're a part of our $5 a month exclusive club, uh, and that's where you get access to all of our content. And for $25 a month, you get all of that content as well, but you'll get your name or your business in the credits and a shout out on the show. If you want to support us here at Michigan Podcast, go to patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. That's patreon.com slash Slash Michigan Podcast. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you, what's your final prediction? Final. For Michigan's 2019 regular season football record, 44% of you said 11-1. and one. Past the Kool-Aid. 36% of you are where I'm at, 10-2. and two. 20% of you said 9-3. and three. All right, let's get to the question of the week, therefore. Do you really believe this is the year our title drought finally ends? And that's from Jim and Sarah. Jim and Sarah? Jim and Sarah. Does anybody know a Jim and Sarah? No? Doesn't ring a bell. All right, well, here's my answer. It better be. Thanks for tuning in to this week's, this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget, you can subscribe to our iTunes version, uh, the YouTube version, the Stitcher version, the Google Play version. Hell, just, I don't know, uh, go outside, we'll scream really loud, and maybe you can subscribe to that version too, okay? That, we call that the, uh, the Audible version. Uh, whichever version you subscribe to, please give us a like, subscribe, five-star review, whenever it's appropriate on that particular platform. Help us to spread the word about what we're doing each week here at Michigan Podcast. You can follow Follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast, online at WolverineDigest.com, and a special shout out to our friends Detroit Sports Podcast who helps us to promote this episode each week as well. Next week, when we return, it has returned. The most wonderful time of the year. It is game week next week, right here on Michigan Podcast. Go Blue.